All right, we are live. Thank you for joining us today. Today I have on the show Anthony Rogers. We're going to be talking about how Allah is a very physical being, how he is definitely not. Um, it's kind of a companion to what we I've been talking about recently, how Muhammad's being deified. And kind of in the same way, uh, all is brought down to be the level of a human being. Let me just open us with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the technology that allows us to connect with fellow believers around the world, as well as unbelievers. One watching this show today that is not a Christian, uh, approach the material with an open mind, that they not simply dismiss what we have but rather uh, look into matters for themselves and investigate whether what we're saying is true or not. We ask that you be with us and you guide our discussion. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so as I said, uh, Anthony is joining us today. Uh, a lot of you probably recognize him from Acts 17 Apologetics. What you may not realize is that he actually has his own YouTube channel, which he was not really contributing any material to until, I don't know, two, three months ago. Started to put up a lot of material. The link to his channel is in the description box. So if you haven't already done so, be sure to check that out and subscribe. Uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, Anthony? Sure. So as you mentioned, my name is Anthony Rogers. I've done a lot of work with David over the years. We first met through our work on answering Islam, which I think is the best resource on Islam, at least in written form. Uh, so if anyone hasn't gone to answering Islam, you should. And that has nothing to do with me. There are a whole host of authors that contribute to the site. Uh, so it's a, it's a great resource. But through that, I came to interact with David. We started doing videos together. Actually, David was doing YouTube before I started doing stuff on his channel. Uh, but I do a great bit more besides uh, those collaborative works. I'm also a pastor. I uh, serve in the prisons in South Carolina. So I'm the regional director for a ministry that goes into the prisons. And some of that just stems from my own background. I was converted as an 18 year old kid in prison back in 1993. I used to run on the streets of Southern California I got in trouble for stealing a car at one point, and it was in prison that I heard the gospel. And that's also where my interest in Islam began because I was surrounded by a number of groups, including Muslims. And I started reading Islamic literature, uh, various things addressing Islam. And so I've been doing that for over 25 years. In addition to pursuing a knowledge of scripture, I have been actively uh, engaging Muslims and trying to proclaim the gospel to them and uh, call them to faith in Christ. Excellent. And you know, what I always appreciate from your talks with David and whatnot is the, the depth of theology you go into. You know, uh, David's very good at mocking Muslims or, or mocking, not really mocking Muslims, more accurately mocking Islam. Uh, and then you come on and, and you know, you're like the, the deep theology I know. I remember an episode where it was you and Sam were both on with David, and yeah, uh, all three of you said like your top objection to Islam, and you like went into this long thing about how it didn't make any sense the theologically, and then David's like, "Yep, you can tell that he is a theologian." <laughs> right after that, and then you know, of course, uh, Sam and David gave their own reasons, but I remember that very distinctly. Mm. But so today's topic, as I said, is the kind of this man God Allah. Um, you know, the, the first thing that is on all our minds, probably, when we, when we first hear this is, well, surely that language is just metaphorical. The, the Bible speaks of God as having, you know, hands and, and a long nose and, and whatnot. Um, and we don't view any of that as literal. So why should we view it as literal when it comes to Islam? Uh, and of course, the first objection that any Muslim will raise is that, the Quran says that Allah is unlike any being and thus he must not be physical. So maybe that would be a good place to start. Uh, Surah 42, for example, says that nothing is comparable to Allah. Yeah, so I do want to begin by 
just sort of going over some of the things you said leading up to that, because that's, that's important. Usually I bring this up and no matter how many times I carefully labor some of these points, people, it's almost like they don't even hear what I'm saying and they'll raise an objection that I've already anticipated. When I first started reading Islamic material, I didn't go into it thinking that it held a concept of God such as I'm about to describe. And I didn't think that for many years. There were things that sort of struck me as peculiar, but things didn't fall into place until a good bit down the road of my studies. But, uh, you know, I'd read the Bible for, for many years. I was simultaneously engaging Muslims, but, uh, you know, more so the, the Bible, because I was a believer and had a, a greater uh, desire to know what scripture had to say than what their corrupt book had to say. But, uh, you know, I read in the Bible of various anthropomorphic expressions, metaphorical, idiomatic expressions, and I knew those weren't intended literally, right? Uh, for example, in Exodus 15, it speaks of God congealing Moses and his armies, or excuse me, Pharaoh and his armies in the midst of the sea, right? At the blast of his nostrils, they, they were congealed in the sea. Uh, that I didn't think was intended to be understood literally. Indeed, it's part of Exodus 15, which is a song, so it's poetic. Uh, I see your cat there, by the way. <laughs> um, likewise, you have statements in the Psalms where it says things like God will cover us under his uh, pinions, his wings. And these are just metaphorical expressions. And so when I turned to the Quran, I would read statements that uh, I just assumed were likewise best understood as figures of speech. They weren't intended literally. However, the more you read anything, the more you start to get into the thought world of that thing, right? You start to realize uh, that maybe you're, you, you haven't sufficiently taken into account the, the uh, larger picture that you now come to appreciate through more and more reading, right? And so one of the things that I, I learned as I read the Quran, so for example, just, just to give you an example, uh, in Surah 3875, uh, Allah rebukes Satan for refusing to bow down to Adam. And the stated reason there, and it's, it's in Surah 3875 in particular, the, the reference to the angels being commanded to bow down to Satan is found in numerous places. But when you find out the stated reason why Satan and the angels should have bowed down to Adam, it's, uh, it's, it's found in 3875. But it's uh, Allah says, how could you refuse to bow down to someone I created with my own two hands? And it, it's very emphatic there, my two hands. Now, uh, that kind of struck me as interesting because that's being given as the reason why Satan should have prostrated to Adam. But I knew that the Quran, like the Bible elsewhere, speaks of Allah creating everything with his hand, right? And that's just a metaphor for God's power. For example, Psalm 19 says, uh, the, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of your hands, right? And we understand that. Again, it's a poetic passage in the Bible. We understand that as a figure of speech referring to God's power. So I just, uh, you know, initially when I read that in the Quran, I'm thinking, okay, that's all the Quran is saying there. However, it, it started, it's, it, it struck me that if this is being given as the reason Satan should bow down to Adam, and it's so emphatic, uh, I mean, how do you account for this in light of the idea that Allah created everything with his hands, right? Because if Allah created everything with his hands, and this is given as a reason why Satan should have prostrated to Adam, then it would likewise entail that Satan, the angel, should bow down to everything because everything alike was created by Allah's hands. So that just sort of had me thinking. I thought, well, that's curious. Uh, you know, what do I do with that? And, and I start reading more and more things in, in the Islamic sources. For example, uh, there's a mutawatir hadith, a mass narrated hadith. So this is a hadith that has great authority in it, uh, the sciences of hadith. Uh, it has multiple chains of narrators, so it's considered sound, uh, extremely sound. And uh, according to these hadiths, they're talking about the day of judgment. And they say that uh, the, basically the day of judgment is going to last 50,000 years. People are going to be waiting for Allah to come. And they're, be, they're going to become more and more anxious uh, as they wait. 
And eventually their fear is going to become so great that they're going to start seeking out people to intercede with Allah, people they think might have some kind of special position with him and maybe will prevail with him in their intercession. So the first person they go to is Adam. And the reason they seek out Adam is given as uh, the, the reason is because Allah created you with his own hands. So that's given to single out Adam as somebody assumed to have a special prerogative. Now, Adam in the Hadith turns them away. He turns them to Noah uh, because he says, I've sinned, so I can't intercede with Allah. And then Noah basically does the same, and he turns them away to Abraham. Then Abraham turns them away, and, and you even you know get to Jesus. Now, what's interesting in the case of Jesus is Jesus uh, doesn't list any sin. He just says, go to Muhammad, right? And of course, go to Muhammad, right? Uh, but uh, uh, in any case, what, what you see in this hadith is everybody is singled out because of some distinctive thing that's true about them. So, for example, Abraham, they go to him because he's called the friend of Allah. So they assume that he'll have the ability to intercede with him. Then they go to Moses because they say, Allah wrote the Torah for you with his own hand. Okay, so again, you have this notion of somebody being singled out, and it's because of something in relation to Allah's hand, right? Uh, just like Adam was created with Allah's hands, Moses had the Torah written for him with Allah's own hand. That's what causes him to be set uh, apart by these people. Uh, and, and as well, in other hadiths, you have this interesting debate between Adam and Moses, Um Hold on, I need to uh, silence this individual apparently um, in my Skype. Um, so uh, they have this dispute where Moses says to Adam when they meet, he says, are you that Adam who caused us to be cast out of paradise even though Allah created you with his own hands? And then Adam gets the better of Moses, it says, because he turns around and he says, uh, didn't you have the Torah that Allah wrote for you with his own hand that told you that he decreed this 40 years before I even existed, right? So here you have both of them uh, referring to the fact that, uh, uh, you know, Adam was created with Allah's hands. Moses had the Torah written with Allah's hands. And then you go and find other hadith. I'll just mention two others real quickly and then address Surah 42. Uh, you have other hadith where it says that you, you've probably heard Muslims talk about the notion of fitrah, right? The idea that everybody is born on fitrah, which is the idea that they all come into the world as Muslims, right? Uh, so you have the hadith that says everybody's born a Muslim. It's their parents that make them a Jew or a Christian or a Zoroastrian or a polytheist. Uh, but uh, when you look at the actual reason behind that, it's uh, based on a statement in Surah 7, as well as Hadith, that say when Allah created Adam, he stroked Adam's back with his hand and drew forth from Adam his progeny, all those that would eventually be born into the world, and he caused them to stand before him and confess his unity, so confess Tawheed. Right. Then he takes people and places them back into Adam and human history then has its beginning. But notice again, Allah's hand in connection with Adam. So uh, the idea that Allah has a hand is uh, uh, it's stated repeatedly in the Islamic sources. And it's stated in ways that make it very apparent that this is uh, not simply a figure of speech. It's to be understood literally. Allah created Adam with his hands. This is what singles him out as especially worthy of prostration by the angels. This singles him out by the believers, the Muslims, thinking that he will have the right of intercession. This is what causes him uh, to get the better of Moses because Moses wrote the Torah with his hand. Uh, I mean, all these things. But then uh, the other thing is you have Hadith narrations where it actually explicitly says that Allah only created four things directly with his own hands, namely Adam. Uh, he wrote the Torah for Moses with his own hands. He planted the trees of the Garden of Eden with his own hands, and he created the pen 
with his own hand. You, you've probably heard references to the pen in the Quran, an odd object for Allah to choose uh, as being especially worthy of creation by his hands. But uh, that means then that when you see these other references to Allah creating everything with his hands, those might be understood metaphorically. However, uh, there are other statements in the Islamic sources that are intended to be understood quite literally. Okay, uh, and then you have just one more hadith. Uh, you have a hadith where Muhammad says, this is a Tirmidhi hadith. Muhammad says that I saw my Lord in the most beautiful form. And then he says, he placed his palm between my shoulder blades and I felt its coolness in, on my chest. Now, uh, this is a particularly strong Uh, indicates a literal hand is touching Muhammad. But in addition to that, this hand has circumscribed limits. It fits between Muhammad's shoulder blades and it causes sensation. Muhammad feels it. So this necessarily entails that Allah, uh, it must be understood in, in terms of having a hand uh, as having uh, you know something that has definite limits, circumscribed limits. It, it's not uh, something that can just be understood as uh, this mysterious something or other. Uh, you know, it's, it's a definite thing that corresponds in some literal way to what we mean by the word hand. Okay, enough rambling here to get to your question, but um, uh, Surah 4211 and its counterpart, Surah 112.4, which says basically the same thing. And by the way, this is a miracle of the Quran because 4211 is simply 1124 backwards, right? Now, I mentioned that because uh, obviously there are some Muslims who, who think that sort of thing proves the Quran, but also because it's a good uh, memory device. But um, these statements have been, it's interesting when you look at Islamic literature, they've been, uh, they've been used by every single group of Muslim in, in, uh, in the formulation of their distinctive Akidah, their distinctive approach to creed. Okay, so you have the, uh, the Mu'atizali, they are the uh, early philosophically inclined Muslims. They were the dominant party in Islam from the 8th to 10th century. The Mu'atizali uh, actually argued that Allah doesn't have any attributes, because if we say he has attributes, then we're ascribing parts to Allah and thus denying his unity. We're denying the fundamental pillar of Islam, which is Tawheed. And so they said, anybody who says Allah has attributes of any sort uh, is actually guilty of shirk, right? So they, uh, and they said, uh, part of their argument was Surah 42.11, Surah 112.4, there's nothing like Allah. So Allah can't have attributes because other beings have attributes and Allah is not like other beings. Right, they would say that Allah doesn't belong to any category. And one of my quick retorts to that sort of thing, by the way, is to say, okay, so Allah belongs to that category uh, uh, that can't be categorized, right? He, he's the, he's a, a, a being that exists in a category all his own, namely uh, the category uh, of no categories. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a logical conundrum. But um, uh, so then you have uh, what uh, over against that was the position of the traditionists. So the traditionists are people like Ahmed bin Hanbal, right? The famed uh, founder of the Hanbali Madha, right? Uh, Ahmed bin Hanbal argued, no, Allah does have attributes, including attributes like face, eyes, hands, palms, fingers, shin, feet, uh, including two right hands, by the way, because the Hadith actually say Allah has two right hands because the left hand is associated with bad things, right? Uh, that's what you wipe your rear with. Uh, that's what you do all the unclean things with. So you can't ascribe a left hand to Allah. So both of his hands have to be right hands. Now, I don't know how he pulled off creating Adam <laughs> with both his right hands. It had to be kind of awkward, but in any case, it always reminds me of one of these freakish Hindu statues, right? Where they, they got all these weird looking deities. In any case, um, so uh, the, the Hanbali uh, Madhab as well, I mean, not just the Hanbalis, but it was, it was a position that was advocated by the traditionalists, meaning those who uh, got their theology 
from the prophetic narrations. They were the masters of the Hadith, and they believed that the Quran shouldn't be interpreted independently of the Hadith. And they accepted the Hadith uh, as is, right? They accepted them at their face value, their apparent meanings. They didn't try to redefine them or explain them away or you know, make them figurative or anything like that. They accepted them at face value. Well, then what you, uh, after, uh, so uh, this is where you get the whole mikhna, the, the whole, um, basically the Islamic inquisition, uh, where they, uh, the, the Wa'tizali, who were the dominant party in Islam, began to persecute the traditionists. And this is where, by the way, the dispute over the, the, the created or uncreated nature of the Quran comes up. Most people know about this, but they don't know about the larger picture. The larger picture is the debate about Allah's attributes, whether he has attributes or not. But uh, one of the things that Ahmed bin Hanbal was arguing is since the Quran is Allah's speech uh, and uh, it's one of his attributes, then the Quran has to be eternal. So that's one of those eternal attributes that Allah has. But it's not the only eternal attribute. It's not the only part of Allah that you know comprises his being. It's one of many attributes like face, like hands, like eyes and everything else. So uh, they eventually, you know, they're persecuting the, uh, the traditionists. And eventually out of this, you get the Ashari who try and uh, steer a middle course between this. They don't reject the traditionists. The, the early Asharis don't reject the traditionist view that Allah has hands. They say he has hands, but kind of emphasize this notion that we don't know how, right? We, we just say that he has hands, but we don't try to explain it. We don't try and explain their modality. But again, the early Asharis are affirming that Allah literally has a hand, even though, you know, it, it um, oh, but my, my point is that uh, the Asharis are coming along, and guess what verse they appeal to, to to make this argument? They appeal to Surah 4211 and Surah 1124, and they say there's nothing like him. So Allah has hands, he has face, he has eyes, but we don't know what they're like, right? Just like an elephant has feet, but they're not like my feet. So Allah has feet, but they're not like our feet, right? So they're literal feet, but we can't say what they're like. And so that's how they justified uh, believing in Allah's attributes in this way, while also believing in passages like Surah 4211, 112, 4. Now, uh, uh, what's interesting is even the uh, anthropomorphists, like the traditionists, the Hanbali school and others, also argued that their position was compatible with Surah 4211. Uh, you know, they could easily point to passages in the Quran where it said things like, for example, Muhammad said of his wives, he said, or he said of, of, the, the, of the, the Muslim women, he said, believing women are not like the unbelieving women, right? Now, obviously, that doesn't mean the believing women don't have hands, don't have feet, don't have eyes, right? So the statement, there's nothing like Allah, doesn't necessarily entail that Allah doesn't have hands, feet, shin, and so forth, any more than it entails that the, the believing women don't have intestines or shins, or, you know, thighs, right? Uh, so every Islamic school of creed or akita found a way to justify their particular position regarding Allah's attributes, including the anthropomorphic attributes, uh, in a way that didn't, in their minds, conflict with Surah 4211. And what's interesting, I'll just make one other point here, what's interesting is if you actually look at Surah 4211, What's going on in the context there is Allah is saying that he created everything in pairs, right? Everything has its mate, right? Among men, among animals, everything that he created has a pair. But then it says that there's nothing like Allah. The point in context is not like that Allah is this transcendent being who is altogether different and other than all other created things. Rather, the idea is that there is no counterpart to Allah. He has no mate. And that's a constant theme in the Quran, right? That Allah has no spouse, right? That's why he can't have a son. If he had a spouse, he could have a son, 
right? That, that's actually an assumption of many of the Quranic passages. And so, uh, again, I mean, the, the logic of the Quran all, just seems to keep pointing in the direction of a thoroughgoing anthropomorphism. And the same thing, by the way, is true in Surah 112. I mentioned 112.4, where it says there's nothing like Allah. In Surah 112, notice that the theme there is that Allah doesn't beget, neither was he begotten. And then it says there's nothing like unto him, right? So the idea there is that Allah doesn't have a counterpart. He didn't beget anyone and so on and so forth. So it has nothing to do with this overly abstract idea that a lot of Muslims think it does. It's just not apparent in the verse. And that's not how it's been used in, uh, in uh, the history of Islamic theology, except with respect to the Mu'tazili, who are now rejected by all Sunni Muslims as heretics. So, yeah, I mean that, that's an excellent point. When you look at Surah 42 or 112, the the context is clearly, um, you know, that there's nothing biological the same way as Allah. Um, to use a modern term, that he's the only member of his species that he can't. Um, Create, have a son because you know that he there's only one of his species it doesn't say anything about him being not physical in fact it's kind of implied that he is physical uh, we do have a comment from uh, inspired by Sheikh Ahmadidat a regular on my channel he thinks he has us here he says that according to the bible your god breathes fire and he cites second uh, samuel 22 9 yeah so again i mean we already went over this, right? This is why I say people don't listen. I, I was, when I, when I started studying the Quran, remember, I went into it with a biblical set of presuppositions. I assumed that Muhammad held, even though he rejected things like the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the incarnation, I thought that at least in terms of his general theology about the nature of God, that it was the same sort of thing, right? That he would teach that Allah is infinite, eternal, unchangeable uh, in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. All these sorts of uh, attributive things I thought would be comparable, right? Between the Bible and the Quran. Because I recognized when I read the Bible that there are figurative expressions. So I went into my reading of the Quran fully expecting it to you know, follow suit. I expected the language uh, employed to be understood properly in a figurative sense, because that is how such language is being used in the Bible, right? And it's, it's easily demonstrable that it's being used that way in the Bible, uh, because uh, the Bible does teach that God is infinite, doesn't it? Uh, first of all, the Bible says God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's John chapter four. It teaches that God is omnipresent, Psalm 139, where David says, where can I flee from your presence? Where can I go from your spirit? If I ascend into heaven, behold, you are there. If I descend into Sheol, behold, you are there. Uh, Jeremiah 23 says God fills heaven and earth. So it's obvious that God is not an embodied being with circumscribed limits if he's able to uh, be present everywhere and is identified as a spirit. Spirit, by definition, means something not extended in space. So God has no, uh, you know, limits to his being. And so when you read these other expressions, now, the, the other thing is that Christians don't deny that God can enter into his creation and interact with his creatures, which necessarily means that God would have to condescend and assume temporarily some kind of form for the sake of interacting with man. And we notice that all throughout scripture and, and the forms are not always the same, are they? God appears to uh, Abraham in Genesis 15, like a smoking fire pot or 17 um, or no 15, excuse me. Uh, God uh, appears in a pillar of fire in uh, Exodus 14. Uh, God appears as an ordinary human being in Genesis 18. Abraham doesn't even recognize that he's the Lord at first. So you have all these different theophanic forms uh, that necessarily entail that it, what, what's going on here is a voluntary condescension on the part of God where he's appearing to men in a way that's comprehensible, intelligible to man. 
But when it comes to the God of Islam, that's not the case. Allah is not described as spirit. He's not described as infinite. In fact, the Quran says that Allah exists above the seven heavens. He is not present in this dunya, according to many Muslim scholars. He is not present here in this dunya. Okay? Now, some Muslims will quote passages of the Quran, like where it says that Allah is closer to you than, his, than your jugular vein. Um, but similar statements are used concerning Satan, by the way. Uh, but the, uh, you know, it says that he's in our blood and all this other kind of stuff. Um, and obviously Satan is not infinite. He's not omnipresent. But what many Muslims will say is when it talks about Allah being with people and that sort of thing, it's not referring to Allah being personally present. It means that Allah's knowledge is present. Somehow Allah's knowledge can be with us while Allah himself is above the seven heavens. Now, whether that's because the angels are here and they're reporting back to Allah, as the Quran frequently says, or because somehow Allah is on you know, such a high perch that he can look down and see all the stuff that's going on because the Quran envisions the earth as kind of like a flat uh, pancake or carpet. Uh, you know, whatever the explanation, the fact is the Quran says Allah exists above the seven heavens. And Muslims say Allah can't enter into his creation. So when the Quran uses this type of language, it, it doesn't, it, it's not the same worldview or context as you have in the Bible, right? It's not the same framework. So again, just to reiterate, I didn't go into the Quran thinking that it taught this sort of stuff. And I assumed the opposite. And it was because of that assumption that it took me so long to kind of realize, hey, wait a minute, uh, you know, I've been approaching this like a Christian instead of thinking of it uh, in light of, uh, you know, the way somebody who is a Muslim would approach this, especially, by the way, a pre is, uh, you know, a, a, uh, somebody in the seventh century. Right. Remember, Muhammad was a pagan. He was raised by pagans. All their deities were embodied beings. And so uh, when you think about it, Muhammad is communicating to pagans. And, uh, you know, that's the default position. So, uh, you know, that, that's my basic answer. There, there's a lot more that could be said. But, uh, yeah, I, the Bible uses figurative language, but it's clear that it's figurative in the Bible. The Quran forces one in the other direction. You know, you, you, can't, you can't explain these things away on the grounds that Allah is using figures of speech because they're far too graphic, they're far too numerous, they're far too palpable, and uh, you know all the things that I gave before. And uh, Allah isn't presented as condescending in the Quran. Rather, Allah is holed up in heaven, and it's there that he's even described as an embodied being. Excellent. Now, there's some chatter in the um, chat about the Trinity. I would just say, make sure to stay on topic. Our subject today isn't the Trinity. As soon as I uh, told Sheikh Didot to stay on topic, he's like, oh, I have to go, bye. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess he doesn't wanna hear about the physical attributes of his God, but that's all right. Uh, anyone else who wants to hear is welcome. Uh, just keep your, top, keep your chat on topic or I will put you in timeout um, because I don't, you know, we, we can discuss the Trinity a different day, but it's not today's subject. So uh, let's keep it on topic. So one of my favorite examples of Allah being a very physical being is the creation of Adam and how the angels mistake Adam for Allah. Uh, can you tell us more about that one? Yeah, so uh, you look at various Hadiths and Muslims will actually debate this, but um, Salafi Muslims will take it straight in a straightforward way. Certainly the Hanbali school would, the Athari's, uh, not Ashari, Athari. Um, but there's a hadith that's fairly well known by people where it, it says that Allah created Adam on his own shape and form, right? 90 cubits tall. The, the question there is when you read it, it just sounds like it's saying Allah created Adam on his own shape and form, right? Allah is the antecedent of his here, right? Allah created Adam on his shape and form, 90 cubits tall. 
And so the straightforward meaning that has been understood by a great many Muslims is that then uh, Adam was created as a kind of physical duplicate of Allah. And, um, you know, there are other things that, that seem to suggest that as well. Uh, but what's uh, interesting is, I mean, and this all ties in, by the way, with prostrating to, to Adam, right? If he's a physical duplicate in some sense of Allah, then it would make all the more sense that he would be an appropriate object of prostration. Well, uh, when you look at Al-Tabari, he gives various narrations and people always criticize, you know, they, they, it's too easy for, you know, certain Muslims like to say, oh, Tabari, you know, he included uh, weak narrations or whatever. Tabari himself tells you, you know, he's, what he's doing is he's, he's, uh, he's including all the different narrations in his uh, tapasir, his history, all these things, because he's, uh, you know, he's, he's gathering up all of this stuff. Um, but uh, I mean, just, just to be a reporter, right? He's reporting everything that's being said. But that doesn't mean just because Al Tabari is correcting everything that you can just dismiss everything. You actually have to go look at the specific narrations to see which ones uh, are, you know, uh, sound by Islamic standards. And besides that, you know, as, as a Christian, when I look at the Hadith sciences, I don't necessarily buy their criteria. Some of their criteria is arbitrary and circular. But in any case, the point, my, my basic point here is just because it's found in Tabari doesn't mean it can be dismissed because he also included sound narrations. But, but one thing that can be said for certain is that this is something that was being taught by Muslims as something that, had, that, that was uh, reported by uh, uh, you know, the companions and uh, Muhammad and so forth. But uh, as the story goes, there are different versions of this. But the basic storyline is that Allah created Adam. He, he sculpted basically Adam into a statue. And then he stood him upright and he left him standing there for 40 years, right, before breathing life into him. And at, at some point, the angels happen upon Adam and they're frightened, right? Now, why are they frightened? You know, what is it that suddenly alarms them about this statue? So think of it. You've got this 90 foot tall statue, the angels come, the angels, right? And, and think of how the angels are described in the Islamic traditions. In the Islamic traditions, they're these fantastic creatures that, uh, you know, sometimes have astronomical proportions and stuff like that. But somehow this figure is so, uh, you know, striking to them, they're alarmed by it. What could possibly alarm these, these beings that are so fantastically powerful and so forth. Well, uh, as the story goes on, uh, Satan is there among the angels. And he says, he basically, he, he's like an early detective, right? He says, I'm going to go over there and, and uh, just don't worry, fellas, I'll figure this out kind of thing. And uh, this, you know, that's not what he literally said. But Satan goes over to this erect statue and he goes in through its mouth and then out through its rear. And then he comes back and he says, don't worry. He says, uh, that is hollow, but your Lord is solid. Your Lord is solid. And what's so interesting, there's so many tie-ins here that are, that are just fascinating. You know, one little thread just leads you to a bunch of other things. Sometimes, you know, these, these discoveries I make are far apart from each other, right? I learned something at one point and then months later, I learned something else and I say, wait a minute, these two things go together. What's interesting is if you look at Surah 112, okay, there's a word there that's actually disputed by Muslims. Uh, it's it's uh, the Surah we were just talking about where it says, uh, say he is Allah, the one, uh, the eternal, he begets not, nor is he begotten, there's none like unto him. Well, the word for eternal there, if you look at different translations of the Quran, it's, it's rendered in, you know, just scores of different ways. Uh, and so you, when I see that sort of thing, that's when I start thinking, why are they all rendering it so differently, right? Is, uh, is it because they're hiding something? Is it because they don't know? Now, I don't have a problem with, this isn't a criticism, right? If a word is, if its meaning is perhaps uh, so uh, uncommon that at this point, we've now kind of lost 
a clear apprehension of what that word means. That's not uncommon in languages, right? You have what's called hapax legomenas in the Bible, where there's a word that's used only once. And then sometimes scholars will debate what that word means, and they'll look at cognate languages. They do all these different studies trying to figure out, okay, what's this word uh, mean? And, you know, so there, I'm not complaining about that, but what ends up, uh, what you find out is, uh, and, and I go back to Tabari here, Tabari has this whole set of uh, uh, explanations of what that word means. Okay, this is in a different, this is in his commentary on Surah 112. And he, he gives 14 different explanations of the meaning of that word. The only hadith that he mentions in those explanations that actually goes back to Muhammad, which he then says is the sound one, actually tells us that the meaning of the word is solid. It means solid, okay? What makes this even more fascinating is that when you look at um, uh, the, the occasion of revelation, right? This is in the science of Quranic interpretation, one of the most important things that you're supposed to do is know about the occasion of revelation. What was the occasion for the revelation of this surah or this ayah of the Quran? You know, what was it that was being addressed or what were the circumstances surrounding it? And what we're told in the Islamic sources is that Muhammad was answering the question, uh, some sources say of a Jew, other sources say of uh, pagans, but either way, what uh, the question was, uh, tell us about your Lord, what is he made of, right? Of what does he consist, okay? Now here, what, what's, uh, you have to remember is first of all, the pagans were thoroughgoing anthropomorphists. They believed in finite embodied deities, right? But likewise, the Jews of Arabia were anthropomorphists, right? I don't have the time to go into all of that, but the Jews, seventh century Jewish Arabs and what have you, they were anthropomorphists. A lot of uh, the hadiths that you find talking about Allah's anatomy are, are being given by uh, Jewish converts to Islam, right? Uh, and, and so, yeah, yeah, just to stop you real quick, uh, Islam yeah. Critiqued actually pointed out that the story of the, you know, 70 foot tall Adam goes back to a source called the Life of Adam and Eve and the Book of the Cave of Treasures, uh, both Jewish sources that the Quran borrowed from. I asked him in the chat if God is solid in either of those. He hasn't replied yet, but that might be the innovation of Muhammad there making, or, you know, the early Muslims making it, uh, the hollow factor might have been added, but the basic story of this gigantic Adam being the first of creation goes back to Jewish sources. Yeah. So, so you have this question, what's he made of? And it's appropriate then that uh, it would say in, in reply in, in that surah, Allah is solid right? Now think about it now. This also connects with the notion that Allah doesn't beget, right? Because Allah has no cavity, right? So you even have, the, there. Uh, I mentioned the early traditionist school in Islam where they took things literally, like Allah's face, his hands, and so forth. Well, some Muslims even went to a, a more radical extreme, and I, I can't remember the term that's used for this group of Muslims at the moment, um, uh, I think it's the Rafidi, the Rafidi, anyways, um, or the, uh, uh, anyways, uh, I'm going to butcher it anyways, <laughs> but, uh, maybe I could pull up. I, I, I know that I've written an article on this where, um, okay. So may, oh no, it's in my, hold on a second here. Well, I'll pull it up while I'm, while I'm talking, but, um, there, uh, oop, I guess I'm wrong here. Sorry, sorry, bear with me one second. No worries. Bear with me one second. Um, all right, here's a, uh, this is, um, I actually have a uh, tablet here as well. Um, Oh, but by the way, let me just point this out real quick. So if you look at the translation of the Quran by Bijan Moinian, it actually says, it says, O Muhammad, say to mankind that God, this is Surah 112, God is the one and only, God is solid, 
right? God is neither born nor has given birth to a, uh, have a son or a daughter and none is like him. So here you have at least a one Muslim translating it accurately according to uh, uh, that word. But uh, here is the uh, translation of or the Hadith narration of Tabari. Um, actually, this is so long, I'm not going to read it, but uh, I could give people the source for it. Uh, and you could put it in the description box later. But uh, here, here are the quotes that I wanted to give you. These are what I'm referring to as the sort of uh, extreme anthropomorphous. It says, uh, a group of our people has narrated from Ahmed ibn Abu Abdullah, from Muhammad ibn Isa, from Yunus ibn Abd al-Rahman, from al-Hassan ibn al-Sari, from Jabir ibn Yazid al-Jufi, uh, who has said the following. I asked Imam Abu Jafar a few things about the oneness of Allah. The Imam replied, Allah, holy are whose names, with uh, which he is mentioned, is exalted and most high in his own self. He is one. In oneness, he is the one and only in oneness. He then made his creatures to know him as the only one. He is one, self-sufficient and holy. All things worship him, and he has the knowledge of all things. Al-Kulaini has said that this is the correct meaning of al-Samad, but not what al-Musabi ha believe. Al-Samad literally means solid as opposed to hollow, which applies only uh, to physical objects. Allah the Most High is far above such attributes. So actually this source that I'm reading um, is, is reporting different people saying different things uh, on this, but it's from uh, uh, Sheikh Abu Jafar Muhammad Ibn Yaqub Ibn Ishaq Al-Kulaini uh, Arazi in his Al-Khafi Part 3. Uh, here's the actual quote that I wanted to read. This is from an early Muslim, a very early Muslim named uh, Hisham bin Salim Al-Jawaliki. Uh, he claimed uh, that what he worshipped is in the form of a man, but without being flesh and blood. So he, ha he has the form of a man, but he doesn't have flesh and blood in, in the sense that, you know, you might think of us as having. He goes on that his, uh, his deity is a diffused white light. He claimed that his deity has five senses and has hands, feet, eyes, ears, nose, mouth. He claimed that his upper half is hollow and the lower half is solid, and that his object of worship has black hair being made of black light, whereas the rest is made out of white light. So remember, by the way, that uh, according to Orthodox Islam, Satan and the, uh, the jinn were created out of fire, right? But they're physical creatures. Um, and, uh, you know, man was created out of water or clay or mud or, or whatever, you know, whatever you want to pick from the Quran's uh, statements. But just because something doesn't necessarily have a, a physical, um, in the sense of flesh and blood, uh, as its starting point doesn't mean that's not its final form, right? So these sources are saying that Allah is made up out of white light and black light and such that the, uh, his lower half now is solid, his upper half is hollow. And the reason they said this, by the way, is because they, 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 were, trying, they were saying that Allah, because he's not, his bottom half is solid, he can't have children, right? This is what they're saying, right? This is their explanation. But they have to say that he has a chest cavity or at least a throat cavity because Allah speaks according to the Quran. So you've got to have, uh, you know, you've got to account for that, right? So there's got to be a diaphragm and lungs and all this kind of stuff. Um, one more quote real quick. This is a, another uh, Muslim. Uh, this is from Dawood al-Jawaribi. He said his deity is a body in the form of a human with flesh and blood and said his upper half is hollow and lower half is solid, that he has curly hair However, he claimed it is a body unlike the bodies and flesh unlike the fleshes and blood unlike the bloods. In other words, he has, he has a body, he has flesh, he has blood, but it's not like our body, flesh, and blood, right? And then he said, listen to this, pardon me for the beard and private parts, but go ahead and ask me about anything else, okay? So what this Muslim is saying is Allah has parts, Allah is an embodied being, you can ask me about any of them, but let's not talk about Allah's private parts, basically. 
And uh, I could go off on a whole thing here about uh, actual authentic narrations that talk about Allah's gonads, uh, but maybe we'll get to that. I'll refrain for now. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so Abdul Qadi said a while back that uh, Allah's form is beyond anything a human being can imagine. Um, if his assertion is correct, I think that Muslims are in some trouble because the Quran declares that they will uh, see Allah on the last days. Is that correct? Yeah, and there's actually a, a, a whole load of problems here, theologically, philosophically. I mean, whether you're looking from the perspective of Christianity or even if you're looking at it in terms of an internal critique in light of the Islamic worldview. I mean, so think about it. Uh, the, the one thing that all Muslims agree on is that they're going to see Allah on the last day, right? You, uh, so for all the debates between the uh, Salafi who affirm for Allah face, hands, eyes, and all of that, and the contemporary Ashari's who say that those are just figures of speech, uh, for all of their differences, all of them agree they're going to see Allah on the final day. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, but one is because this is, again, based on mutawatir narrations, right? Sound narrations that can't be denied uh, because they're so uh, plentifully attested in the uh, Hadith traditions. And, and, and they're not just, uh, it's not just that you have multiple chains for this specific Hadith. You have all kinds of other sound narrations that tie in with this. But, uh, the, and the Quran, of course, says they're going to see Allah, Right. Uh, the, the, the Quran says that uh, people will see Allah uh, on the day of uh, resurrection. Uh, so, um, uh, hold on here. Just trying to pull up one of these. Uh, looks like my. Hmm. All right. Um, Sorry again, folks. I'm just trying to pull these up as we speak. Um, in any case, I'll keep I'll keep talking while uh, while I find this. But uh, so the Quran talks uh, about Allah being seen on the day of resurrection, and the, the way the Hadith narrate this is they say uh, so. People say, okay, if we're all going to be standing there on the day of uh, resurrection, and we're gonna be waiting for Allah to appear. And this is what we're all looking forward to as Muslims. Uh, but there's gonna, there's gonna be people there from all of human history, right? So it's gonna be billions of people there. Their, their, their concern is in part, how are we going to see Allah, right? If, if there's gonna be so many of us, isn't that going to hinder us all from being able uh, to see him? And Muhammad uh, then asks, he, he points up to the, to the sun, uh, or he doesn't point up to it, but he says, do you have the trouble seeing the sun on a clear day? And they say no. And he says, do you have any trouble seeing uh, a full moon when you know, there's no clouds in the sky? And they say no. And he said, so likewise, you'll have no trouble seeing Allah on the day of resurrection. So very clearly it states that they're going to see Allah and notice that Muhammad is speaking in terms of physical sight and he's speaking of real visible physical objects, right? Like sun and moon. And he says, just like you see them on a, on a clear day, on a clear night, so likewise you're going to see Allah. Well, then the Hadith go on, it's even more interesting. The Hadith goes on to say that uh, Allah is... Uh, going to appear at some point. Uh, so first of all, there's going to be a bunch of groups, right, that are going to be turned away by Allah, right, until it's the Muslims who um, remain. And then at a certain point, Allah is going to appear to them in a different form other than his true form. Okay. So again, you have the idea that Allah has a form, but somehow he's going to shape shift or, or cause them to think that he has a different appearance. And so when people see him, they're, they're, they're going to refuse to accept him as their Lord, right? Until Allah does something that causes them to recognize him, right? <clears throat> and it, uh, so some Hadiths talk about Allah exposing his shin to them, right? 
And somehow this shin is just so spectacular that they're going to say, that's him, right? That's our Lord, uh, obviously, right? Who, who has a shin like his shin? Um, but other narrations, what's really interesting, this is the one I find actually the most fascinating. It says they're going to reject these other appearances of Allah until he appears in his true form. And then it says, uh, which will be nearest to the picture they had in their minds about him. Okay. So notice that the, the, the Muslims are going to reject these other appearances, but they're going to accept Allah when he appears in a way that now corresponds to the picture they had in their minds about him. Now, this already assumes that Allah has some kind of form, has some sort of features, identifiable features. But it also assumes that Muslims have a mental image of him, a picture of him in their minds. Now, what is that but idolatry, especially on the principles of Islam, right? Muslims are the ones who tell us that making a statue, even making a picture uh, of somebody, like not even a deity, right? Just a picture, taking a photograph, any kind of still image. Certainly Salafi Muslims will say this. If you, you can't have a still image of someone, uh, uh, actually Salafis even debate this, but anyways, um, you can't make a picture of Muhammad, obviously, right? Uh, you certainly can't make a picture of Allah. That's considered idolatry. It's considered shirk. But here, according to the Hadith, all Muslims are to have a mental picture of Allah in their minds. Now, where would they get such a picture, right? Who painted the picture for them that they're going to have or should have in their mind so they can recognize Allah on the day of judgment? Well, of course, Muhammad in the Quran and Sunnah, right? Muhammad painted that picture for them. Um, now, but here's the other thing that I find interesting about this. Even if you take away all this question about Allah's anatomy and all those sorts of things, one of the questions that I had early on when I read this sort of thing, because remember, Muslims will say that Allah is absolutely one, and they argue it in such a way that it must preclude any kind of diversity. That's why the whole attributes issue in Islam is such a, a problem, because no matter what direction Muslims go in, they find themselves in a bind, right? They, because if you say Allah has attributes, then in principle, you're saying Allah is both one and many in some fundamental sense, right? Uh, the early Mu'tazili said that this is shirk. Right, you're guilty of, of associating plurality with Allah, which is like the Jews and Christians. And so they said, you're guilty of shirk. But if you say Allah doesn't have attributes, then you, you ultimately strip Allah of any kind of defining identifiable characteristics, in which case Allah becomes a blank. He's an undefinable, indescribable being, right? And so, um, but, but, but think about the issue here. If my, my question to Muslims is this, in light of the idea that they'll see Allah, are you going to see all of Allah on the day of judgment or only part of him? Okay. If you say you're going to see all of Allah, then it either means Allah is not infinite or, or man is somehow infinite because otherwise you're saying finite vision can encompass him, which makes him finite. So either Allah is finite so that finite vision can encompass him or man is somehow infinite at this point so that he, his vision can encompass him. Now, but, but if you say, okay, they're not going to see all of Allah, they're only going to see part of him. Well, okay, then that entails that Allah consists of parts, right? If you're only going to see part of him, not all of him, then Allah is a composite being, a being that has parts part of which can be seen, parts of which can't be seen. So if Allah is made up of parts, then, then you don't really believe that Allah is absolutely one. You're admitting in some sense that Allah uh, is not only one. He also, uh, you know, there's plurality associated with his being. And if you as a Muslim can say that Allah is both one and many, then I can certainly, as a Christian, can say that God is both one and many in a much greater sense, namely he exists as a plurality of persons, and you can't object to that in principle, right? You might claim that this is not true, and we can talk about that, but you can't object to it as an, a logical impossibility 
or an incoherent notion because you've already admitted it in principle, at least with respect to the question of Allah having attributes and so forth. So anyways, uh, I can keep going on and on on any one of these points because uh, they fascinate me. So yeah, uh, well, we, we, point. we have an interesting comment about the shin. You know, this idea that somehow all it will be recognized by the shin just seems so bizarre on the surface that I've heard a number of theories about what it was originally intended to mean that that meaning has been lost. Um, Andrew Martin gave one of those theories. He says to expose the shin refers to the covering over the Kaaba, which implies that Allah's idol is beside the door. To expose the shin means lifting Allah's skirt or the cover of the idol. And for Muslims to expose Allah's shin by lifting his skirt or Kaaba cover means that uh, Muhammad rules Mecca. Uh, another theory I've heard is that it refers to the Zoroastrian god uh, Ahura Mazda. He has like this ring around his stomach area that I've heard is sometimes called a shin. Um, what do you think of those alternate ideas about what this shin could be? Yeah, so um, let me just pull up. Um, here is the, remember that the hadith that mentions Allah's shin is addressing the question how how do uh, are we going to see our Lord? And then Muhammad says, you're going to see him just like you can see the sun or the moon, okay, on a, on a well-lit night or uh, uh, without clouds in the sky. So it's addressing the issue of seeing Allah. And then it goes on to talk about Allah's form. It's talking about Allah first appearing in something other than his true form, then appearing in his, uh, uh, in his true form and exposing his shin. So all of this is of a piece. It all points in the direction of literally talking about Allah's shin. It's not talking about the Kaaba uh, or any of these other, uh, you know, purported notions. Uh, that just, that, that simply doesn't work. Um, so let me just read the Hadith. Uh, this is one of the Hadiths, by the way. It says, then the Almighty will come to them in a shape other than the one which they saw the first time. And he will say, I am your Lord. And they will say, you are not our Lord. And none will speak to him then, but the prophet. And then it will be said to them, do you know any sign by which you can recognize him? They will say the shin. And so Allah will then uncover his shin, whereupon every believer will prostrate before him. And there will remain those who used to prostrate before him just for showing off and for gaining reputation. It goes on. So again, this is dealing with a very um, anthropomorphic, uh, it's a very anthropomorphic context, the whole thing you know, through and through uh, is anthropomorphic. And, and there are Muslims who, again, take this, uh, 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 it, the Hadith, by the way, is Surah 9, it's, it's, excuse me, it's uh, found in Sahih Bukhari, volume 9, um, uh, number 93, uh, 532S, right? I, I'm always trying to remember. So it's, it's actually, it's volume 9, Book 93, number 532S. Um, and uh, it, it mentions clearly Allah's shin in connection with this otherwise anthropomorphic setting. Excellent. So uh, Abdullah Qadi had a brilliant response. He says, what your speaker professing are all nonsense. It never deserve an answer. So uh, I would just say, you know, I mean, if, if it's nonsense, then uh, the Hadith are nonsense. And Islam is false. So, I, I mean, I, I think we agree that the, this is nonsense, but we're not making it up. Uh, it was Muslims that made this stuff up. Yeah, I mean, the, there's so many issues always with, with, with this stuff. You know, one thing is, if Allah speaks so clearly, that's his boast in the Quran. Muhammad claims that not only are the words of the Quran as Allah's speech, the, the perfection of eloquence, inimitable, can't be imitated. But he also claims that his speech is su uh, superior to all other speech, right? Not superior to Allah's, but his inspired utterances outside the Quran. Uh, he says, uh, Allah sent me with uh, uh, 
uh, the most beautiful of expressions with uh, the widest possibility of meanings, right? He's, he's boasting of the speech that Allah gave him. And if this is the case, then, you know, Allah certainly could have communicated better if he didn't want people thinking that he literally has a form. He literally has a shin. He literally has hands, right? If, if Allah is so perfect in eloquence, uh, he should have spoken better. So much so that, uh, you know, Muslims wouldn't have to be reduced to just calling our arguments nonsense. You know, one of the things I always tell people, because, you know, I get people saying things like, um, you know, I, they'll say things like, um, you know, you're so, you're so, your argument's so stupid, right? I had this guy on my uh, YouTube page the other day. He said, um, he said something like, uh, listen here, little fella, you know, your argument's uh, too stupid to respond to. And, you know, my, or he said, he says, listen here, little fella, your argument is stupid or something like that. Now, I always take all of that and I say, fine, you know, I'll happily take those titles. I'm little and I'm stupid. But now, guess what? Unless you can answer me, right, then you're in an even worse position, right? I'm happy to be little and stupid, but now that means that you can't uh, refute a pygmy right? Uh, you can't refute, uh, you know, an, an idiot. And so where does that leave you, right? If our arguments are nonsense, then it would be all that much easier for you to refute us, right? It, it wouldn't be, you know, it's nonsense. And so I can't refute you, or it's nonsense, and I won't refute you. I mean, isn't, isn't every argument you disagree with wrong, right? I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me. If, if you're saying that some other argument is wrong, well, that's the reason you refute it, right? So if we're saying something that's nonsense, that's not an excuse not to refute it. That's an invitation to refute it. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, we could do the same thing, right? Okay, all your arguments against the Trinity are nonsense. You know, right? Your arguments against the deity of Christ are nonsense. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm actually very active in the comments. And usually when I get one of those type comments, I reply, uh, you know, and yet you can't refute me. So where does that leave you or, or something like that? Uh, we do have a question from uh, Jamal Khan. He says that uh, is Allah made of horse sweat? He heard that in a Christian Prince video. And I don't know what that refers to, but maybe you do. I do not know. So I won't even... I won't say, um, you know, Christian Prince knows Arabic and maybe is aware of something I'm not, or it, it could be facetious, or maybe he's, you know, we sometimes say Allah is a mouse, right? Because of the way Muslims argue, they say if a word sounds like something in the Bible, then it means that like uh, in, in uh, so, uh, Song of Solomon, uh, chapter five, it uses the, the Hebrew word mach, machmadim, right? It has the chet there. And uh, Muslims will say it's to be pronounced Muhammadim, and that, it, uh, that it's the name of Muhammad, and it isn't, right? It's an adjective there. It's being used as a, uh, you know, altogether lovely. Um, but uh, so if, if they want to argue from the sound of words, then akhbar uh, sounds like mouse, uh, in Arabic. And so we'd say Allah is a mouse, right? Um, so maybe, maybe uh, he's, you know, Christian Prince is playing off of the sound of something in there. I don't know. I'm just saying, uh, I'm not aware of that. Yeah, we have a couple comments. Apparently it comes from a Daif Hadith. Oh, okay. Well, th those are the fun ones. I'm not. Yes. Exclusive. Uh, oh, you know, the, they're uh, weak, but they're not necessarily false. They're just right. not completely supported. Well, yeah. So, I mean, the, the, uh, the people don't understand that that classification means it made it right. Daif means it, it's, it's, it's accepted. Now, some Muslims will say that uh, Daif hadiths can only be used in certain areas to establish certain things. I mean, there's all kinds of discussions among Muslims, but bottom line is it's not a rejected hadith, right? It's, it's just considered to be weak either because you know, there's a, we don't know who this narrator was in the chain here or, you know, some other reason like that. Uh, yeah. Um, so I, we get, apparently it's a hadith that hasn't been translated out of Arabic, but uh, 
Andrew Martin gave the summary. Apparently when Allah wanted to create himself, he created horses and made them run and then sweat. And then he created himself from the sweat of the running horses. Sounds very bizarre to me. Interesting. Interesting. So I wonder if that's in, so uh, they've been translating the Musnad of Ahmed bin Hanbal, and I've been keeping up with those. There's four out so far. And, uh, but Ahmed bin Hanbal's Musnad is much larger than Bukhari and other things. So uh, I'm anticipating some good Hadiths in there. Definitely. So uh, getting back to our subject, uh, we, we heard about how uh, Muslims will recognize Allah by his shin. Uh, we've kind of alluded to the two right hands, but we haven't really discussed that yet. So where does the idea that Allah has two right hands come from? Okay, well, so the Quran itself says he has hands, right? My two hands, Surah 3875. Um, other places... Uh, also make reference to, right, uh, I'm just trying to pull it up here. I'm hoping I have it. I may not have it here in my, uh, in any case, uh, it's, I don't have it in my notes. Oh, actually, I might have it uh, right over here. It's a hadith that comes from um, uh, Muslim, but let me, let me pull it up here. I think I have it in another article I wrote. Um, let's see. Oh, I know why. I'm looking at it. Um, hmm. Uh, while you're while you're looking for that, we had a couple comments about so-called hadith science in the chat. Uh, Live Evil says the whole is not science is as absurd as everything else. I wish they translated the tafsirs without removing the embarrassing stuff. Uh, there was a comment about how uh, Sahih Bukhari collected six hundred thousand hadith or whatever and only kept three thousand of them, as if that somehow makes them more true just because he rejected a bunch of duplicate and stu uh, stuff and stuff that he didn't um, believe was true. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I get this all the time, you know, you know, Muslims are like, well, the, you don't know who the, who wrote the Bible, but we know exactly where all these Hadith came from. And it's like, yeah, you know, give me one historian who says that they judge a reliability of a historical source based on a chain of supposed narration at the start of the source. If someone was making it up, they could just make up a source of, of narration just as easily as they could make up the story, probably even more easily than they could make up the story. So it's just kind of silly. And it's all circular too, because they, they decide what they want to be true or you know when these things were decided years and years ago, they decided which ones were true and then they judged the value of the narrators based on which hadith they'd already decided were true so it's just completely circular yeah so here is a hadith that says that <clears throat> this is actually one from uh, sunan an nisai uh, and it's graded sahih by the way uh, but it says it was narrated from abdullah bin amr bin al as that the prophet said those who are just and fair will be with allah most high on thrones of light at the right hand of the most merciful those who are just in their rulings and their dealings with their families and those of whom they are in charge. Muhammad, one of the narrators, said in his hadith, and both of his hands are right hands. Definitely. And it also has something to do with the, go back to the creation of Adam, right? Doesn't the um, creation of Adam say that Adam was created with his two right hands, I believe? Well, it says with his own two hands in Surah 38.75, um, I'm not aware of any Hadith or anything that says, that specifies when talking about Adam's creation that it was with two right hands, but that would be the inference. If Allah has two hands and both of them are right, then when it says he created Adam with his two hands, it would, it would mean with his two right hands. 
um, unless Muslims reject logic, which wouldn't be surprising. <laughs> Uh, yeah, definitely. So we often hear about the, the two right hands or the shin, those two particular attributes get brought up a lot. Um, but what are some of the other attributes that are clearly physical in the, the Hadith and whatnot? Well, so um, I, I've got a whole list of things. In fact, I've got a, a paper here that I never finished. It's about 100 pages long. I just started cataloging all the <laughs> anthropomorphic references as I was going along. But let me just read for you a list of things I've got here. Um, if I can get to the list. Um, well, so uh, it says uh, Allah had, well, first of all, some of this won't be as uh, intelligible to people if you don't realize how Muslims use some of the language, but uh, Muslims will deny that Allah is a thing and a person, but there are hadith that actually use the term thing and person. So that's, a, that's significant in its own right. Uh, there's also the fact that uh, the Quran and Sunnah both say that Allah has a soul. When you look at how the word soul is defined, uh, it literally means a disembodied spirit, right? So it's a spirit that had a body uh, or is in a body, right? Uh, so if Allah has a soul, then it also would suggest that Allah uh, is an embodied being, right? And one example of this is Surah 5116, where it's not even translated correctly in most translations, but Allah questions Isa and says, did you say to uh, man, take me and my mother for two gods? And Isa will allegedly say, far be it from me to, to say such a thing. Uh, and then he says, you know what's in my soul, but I don't know what's in yours. Right. Or it says, you know, what's in my the, the English translations usually say, you know, what's in me. I don't know what's in you or they'll or they'll say, you know, what's in my soul, but I don't know what's in yours. And it, it's even there. It's not explicit. Right. But it's still evident. But what the Arabic literally says, you know, what's in my soul, uh, but I don't know what's in your soul. Right. So it literally uses the word soul in both cases. Um, and then you have other hadiths that say that as well. But then you have uh, hadiths that talk about Allah's image, Allah's form, Allah's shape, Allah's height, Allah's, and, and not just hadith, but Quranic references for some of these as well. He has a face, he has eyes, he has ears. Some hadiths talk about Allah's mouth, his hair, his beard. Uh, some talk about his arms, his elbows, his hands, his fingers, his palms his thumb, his pinky finger, his fingertips. Uh, they talk about his back, his side, his waist. And of course, we mentioned his shin. Uh, it talks about his feet. Uh, there are Hadiths that talk about his loins. There are Hadiths that talk about Allah's movement from one place to another, Allah going up and down. Uh, hadiths that talk about Allah's shade. Uh, hadiths that talk about Allah sitting on a throne, the Quran as well, of course. Uh, hadith that talk about Allah having a house and, and looking out over a watchtower. Uh, there are even hadith that talk about Allah being, uh, you know, having a veil, right, uh, so to screen him from his creature. So Allah has a hijab, apparently, according to the Islamic sources. Um, now, one that's really interesting, I don't know if you heard me mention this the other day. Um, I think, oh yeah, I was on with David is when I mentioned it. So if you were watching that broadcast, he, somebody asked a question about the Dajjal, right? The Islamic concept of antichrist. And uh, so the, this person was saying, isn't it interesting that Muslims have some similarities to Christianity when it comes to their eschatology, a return of Jesus, an antichrist figure, that sort of thing. David made the observation, well, Muhammad is you know, getting stuff from Jews and Christians, but he also convolutes things, right? He gets things uh, all confused and uh, the eschatology there ends up being a model mess. But um, what I find interesting when I look at the Hadith regarding the Dajjal is the Hadiths say the Dajjal is one-eyed, right? So it's, uh, the Hadiths are trying to, um, describe the Dajjal so people can recognize him, right? So this is one way you can recognize the Dajjal. He's going to be one-eyed, right? Um, I heard uh, um, 
Robert Spencer the other day say that he's actually blind in one of his eyes, uh, or I think 90% of it he can't see out of, um, or he doesn't have 90% of his vision. And uh, he said, so some Muslims would uh, like to call me the Dajjal. He says, but it's the wrong eye, right? Um, so he's not the Dajjal. Uh, but anyways, um, but what's interesting about those Hadiths is how it, it goes on to say, the Dajjal is one-eyed, but your Lord is not one-eyed, right? And so what it's doing is it's saying, this is how you can distinguish Dajjal from Allah, right? This is one clear way to distinguish this figure from your Lord. And so again, you have this, this narration where this is part and parcel of why a Muslim can be expected to know what Allah looks like when they see him on the day of judgment because Muhammad is giving them clear descriptions in his, uh, in his teachings, right? So um, uh, Allah has two eyes and the eyes of Allah are also mentioned, uh, you know, in the Quran, uh, it talks about, uh, in fact, uh, one of my favorite uh uh, passages in the Quran regarding anthropomorphism, it, it, it'll sound to you kind of like the Bible for a minute until you realize that Muhammad has kind of turned things on their heads, right? Um, in Surah uh, 7, 195, it says, um, oh, Surah 7, I'll go to 194 uh, and then read 90, 195. It says, verily those whom ye call upon besides God, so it's, he's talking to the, the polytheists, those whom you call upon besides Allah are servants like unto you. Call upon them and let them listen to your prayer if you are indeed truthful. Have they feet to walk with or hands to lay hold with or eyes to see with or ear, ears to hear with? Say, call your God partner, scheme your worst against me and give me no respite for my protector is Allah who revealed the book and so on and so forth. Now, the, um, uh, the, 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 law, the rationale of the Hadith, it, it almost sounds like what you'd see in, in the Psalms where they're ridiculing the false gods, right? Where they're saying they have feet, but they can't walk, eyes, but they can't see, ears, but they can't hear, right? Um, but Muhammad has this turned on its head. Muhammad is saying, uh, you know, these things can't walk, see, or hear because they don't have feet, eyes, or ears. That, that's a, a very different kind of reasoning. And so he's suggesting they're not truly gods. They can't really do these things because they don't have those features. And so this is why, you know, even, you know, famous Muslims, you know, you talk, we were talking about hadiths. One of the most famous hadith scholars in the history of Islam was Ibn Khuzayma. He actually has a voluminous set of hadiths uh, besides Bukhari, Muslim, and Nisai, Abu Dawood, and so forth. Uh, he has a voluminous series of hadiths, but he was considered a giant of hadith uh, scholarship even by Muslims outside of his own madhab. Uh, but based on this hadith or this uh, ayah of the Quran, Here's what Ibn Khuzayma said. So uh, he was speaking here to um, uh, the early Muslims of Tabaristan and Is Isfahan, so an area of Islamic uh, uh, study at the time. But he said, if Allah does not have eyes or ears or hand or foot, then what we are worshiping is a watermelon. Now, uh, I mean, it always reminds me of a Mr. Potato Head, right? Because, but notice what he's taking for granted here. He's taking for granted that Allah has some kind of form, right? He has some kind of shape. And so he says, if he doesn't have eyes, ears, hands, limbs, and so forth, then he's like a watermelon, right? It's being taken as a given that Allah has some shape. And so if you strip away all these other features, then Allah is just this sort of blob, right? This, this watermelon, this amorphous thing, right? Um, but he still understood as a, a physical thing of some sort, uh, a limited being. And that's based again on Surah 7, uh, 195. And even Kuzaima is hardly the first or the last Muslim to, to reason in that way. Uh, you had Abu Yala, another Hanbali, uh, 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 and so on and so forth. Uh, 
Excellent. Uh, so you, you mentioned a lot of his body parts there. Um, you know, some of those you would be hard pressed to think of how they could possibly not be literal. Like, for example, you, you mentioned his beard and it's like, yeah, if you're saying your God has a beard, I'm pretty sure you're saying he's a physical being. There's not really anything symbolic about having a beard as far as I know. Uh, yeah. But one of the one of the interesting body parts, I think, is that the face, because something weird happens with all his face at the end of time. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah. So according to the um, according to the Quran, everything will perish except Allah's face. <laughs> so I like to say, uh, you know, that Allah's like the ultimate Cheshire cat, right? Remember. In Alice in Wonderland, the Cheshire cat's body disappears. Everything starts to disappear, and all that's left first is a face, and then just the smile, right? And so, uh, if you take the Quran literally, and everything perishes except Allah's face, then that would mean the rest of His anatomy perishes, except for His face. And uh, you know, what, what do you do with that? Um, doesn't mean he can't make the rest of him, I guess, but uh, re remake the rest of him. But, uh, it, you know, it's, it's going to perish along with the rest. And by the way, this is part of why it's so important to, to recognize that Allah is called a thing. That's why I said some Muslims have trouble with that, because when it says everything will perish, if Allah is called a thing, then Allah will perish. So you have some Muslims saying he's never called a thing. Right. Uh, and so that's why it's relevant that there are. Uh, narrations that say Allah is a thing, a, a uh, shaft is the Arabic word for that. Um, and then, yeah, the, the other things that, uh, by the way, oh, I did want to say, you mentioned the beard again. There are actually, so the, I would say that the weaker narrations in, in terms of Allah's physical appearance, his face, the weaker narrations have Allah with a beard. The stronger ones say that he's a beardless youth. And this is, this is extremely interesting for a couple of reasons, right? Um, number one, of course, just for the issue of anthropomorphism, it, it presents Allah as, as, as somehow, uh, you know, literally uh, appearing in a human, you know, having a human form as his actual form, right? Not, not some temporary uh, assumed form. But uh, the other thing is because of course, Muslims, the beard, right? But here's their deity being a beardless youth. And so, but, but the, the real interesting he thing here is what happened in the early history of Islam. And uh, I haven't, I don't have any sources written on this. I can tell you where to go to get this though. Uh, I'm in a hotel at the moment, but uh, Joseph von S wrote an article, an essay called The Youthful God. That's the first thing. And then he wrote um, another book. Gosh, the title's escaping me. Um, in any case, Joseph von Es was a scholar and he studied the early history of Islam. And, and one of the things he was really interested in is the notion of anthropomorphism in Islam, in Islamic history. And one of the things he pointed out was some of the bizarre practices that resulted from these teachings of the Quran. So now, now think about this. I want you to put something together. Um, the Quran says that people are to remember Allah, right? So this led to the practice of early Muslims sitting around thinking about Allah, right? Meditating on Allah, right? Now, if you couple this with these hadiths that describe Allah as a beardless youth, okay? So now you've got uh, all these Muslim men sitting around meditating on Allah, envisioning him like a beardless youth. Well, one of the practices that this led to among certain early Muslim communities was the practice of staring at young boys. I'm not making this up. This is all, <laughs> you know, uh, I don't I mean, I feel, I feel dirty to some degree talking about it, uh, but you can you let your thoughts run wild here and, and imagine where some of this led to, because it doesn't stop there, right? Uh, but all of this stems from the Quranic teaching uh, of Allah as an embodied being, and people are supposed to uh, remember Allah, and they're even looking forward to the day when they're going to gaze at Allah. So this is the direction of their thought. 
And so when you put things together, Allah's a beardless youth, and you know, what better to aid you in your meditation on Allah than having some actual beardless youth standing there. Uh, but anyways, um, go check out Joseph Von S. I've always wanted to write something on this. I just haven't gotten around to it. Um, you know, and then I could get into Allah's gonads and, and all the rest. Excellent. Yeah, that, that one was new to me. I, I had not <clears throat> heard about Muslims uh, taking many young men and staring at them. Crazy stuff there for sure. Uh, any addition to point out why the, these body parts must be physical and whatnot? Or should we take some questions from the chat? Well, I'll just briefly reiterate something. So I, I, one issue regarding the hands, uh, the reason I, I usually go there is because there's more stated about Allah's hands than anything else. I only gave a, a, a handful of evidence regarding it, but the evidence for Allah's hands being literal hands is much more plentiful. But one thing I did say, remember, is that the, uh, the narrations teach very clearly that there are only four things created directly with Allah's hands. Adam, the Torah, the Garden of Eden was planted by his hands, the pen was created with his hands. So this has to be understood as different than the way everything else was created. And since everything else was created with Allah's power or Allah saying be, uh, there has to be a literal sense to this that's not true of uh, other things. Also, uh, the Hadiths are very descriptive. They talk about uh, Allah's hands uh, stroking Adam's back, uh, causing sensation on uh, Muhammad's chest. Uh, fitting between his shoulder blades. Uh, they go on to give details. It doesn't just say hands, you know, and, and leave that uh, to your imagination. They even talk about his palms, his fingers, his fingertips. Uh, they talk about his fingertips, uh, fingertips giving off light, you know, and different things. Um, you know, so for all of these reasons and more that could be given. Uh, in fact, I wrote an article, if you go on Answering Islam, uh, if you go on the left-hand column on the answeringislam.org website, answeringislam.org, the left-hand column, you scroll down to where it says individual authors. You press that, and then it'll pull up like 50 different names. And then if you select my name, Anthony Rogers, and then scroll down the list of articles I wrote, there's one on Allah's hands. It says Allah's hands, and you'll see just how many references there are to Allah's hands. So I'd say that the hands of Allah are, are a big uh, go-to issue because there's more stated about his hands, but um, uh, there's a lot stated about his other attributes as well. You know, his, his face is mentioned in the Quran. His eyes are mentioned in the Quran. His side is mentioned in the Quran. Um, and then the Hadith just fill out the picture, right? Talking about his loins talking about his palms and fingers and fingertips, um, his molar teeth. <laughs> I forgot his molar teeth. <laughs> um, yeah. Yep, absolutely. So uh, if people have any questions that are related to this topic, you can go ahead and put those in the chat right now. Uh, we'll be signing off in a little bit, but we have some time for Q&A first. Uh, I'll start it with a uh, general question for you. <clears throat> There's kind of two strategies to critiquing Islam. One is to kind of just take their sources for granted and show that, you know, they contradict or that they're absurd or they, uh, you know, paint an incoherent picture of a religion or of a God. And then the other strategy is to, you know, kind of question the reliability of the, the scriptures, show that they don't really have any historical basis, that they don't go back to Muhammad and whatnot. Um, which of those two strategies do you think is more effective? Well, so I've always just taken the approach that, uh, you know, to take the Islamic sources for what they say, because to me, I mean, that gives me everything I need to refute Islam, right? Uh, not, not, I mean, so I'm not saying they're, 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 uh, I'm not granting, I'm not saying that they're true in the sense of, uh, you know, there was a, everything they say about Muhammad happened or anything like that. I'm just saying, fine, I'll give you those hadiths. Now let's talk about how ridiculous all of this is, right? 
let's talk about how problematic all of this is. If you're going to hand me sources that say your prophet thought he was demon possessed, your prophet said that Satan put his words in his mouth, your prophet said that he was bewitched, your prophet wanted to commit suicide because he thought he was possessed, your prophet, when he got his revelations, gave off, you know, he, he, there were physical activities associated with that that looked like demonic possession. Your prophet kept saying in the Quran, I'm not possessed, I'm not possessed, I'm not possessed, I'm not possessed. So many times that he sounds like, you know, a guy that maybe thinks he could be possessed, but is trying to talk himself out of it, right? Um, if you're going to hand me stuff like that, I'm going to say, fine, let's run with it, right? Um, and you're going to tell me that his revelations began with this malevolent spirit manhandling him in a cave, like this was a UFC match, right? Choking him out. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what, you know, that's just pure gold to me. I'm like, you know, give me more of that. Right. But I certainly don't criticize people that are taking the other approach and say, Hey, there's a lot to question here historically. Right. We, we've got a lot of problems here. And, and I'm not saying I'd never change my game plan. I'd never shift to that, but I'd want to have, um, I'm just so comfortable and used to the other way of doing it that I just sort of stick with that. Um, but I love stuff that Jay Smith is talking about recently. Um, Spencer has been talking about for a long time. And, and there are elements of that that I usually, that I still tie in to my apologetics. So, so like, as an example, um, I won't question the Hadiths for the most part. Uh, Muslims question the Hadith more than I do, right? <laughs> That's a weak Hadith, you know, <laughs> say, my goodness, says Sahih here in my edition, right? But, um, uh, but when, when Muslims want to argue against the Bible, they'll say, oh, this is unreliable, right? So then I'll turn around and say, well, wait a minute. You know, your hadiths come 200 years after the time of Muhammad or the, the Sira literature comes 200 years after Muhammad or whenever you, uh, whatever literature you're talking about, right? Um, so I might turn the tables at that point and say, all this stuff then has to be ditched. But uh, just in terms of my basic approach, I say, fine, uh, all these things are were stated by Muhammad. So Muhammad's an antichrist, right? He rejected the father and the son. Uh, you know, he, he, uh, he taught that Allah is uh, the best of deceivers. Fine. I don't have any need to, to try and say that's all, you know, nobody really ever said, uh, Muhammad never said that, right? Um, that's just my approach. But. Excellent. Yeah, you know, I, I think that they, they both have their place for sure. And you're quite right that Muslims are very quick to try to deny their own sources. It's the most bizarre thing in the world to me that they, to defend their religion, they tell me their sources are untrue. I, they don't seem to understand why that's problematic to say all the material written by early Muslims is untrue, but Islam's true somehow. Turning this noise off over here. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we have a, a comment from Villainous. He says, the whole description of Allah is implying a God within a universe rather than independent of it. Like the Greek gods, i.e. pagan and feel, existence is more powerful than Allah. Uh, and I would just add that, uh, you know, in some aspects saying that he, he, the, he's very physical and whatnot explains why he can't enter into creation because, you know, he's a, a different type of matter or whatever and he's up on his throne and he can't come down here because he's a physical being uh any thoughts you'd like to add to that yeah so a <clears throat> number of things here um <laughs> there, there's always so much when it comes to islam isn't there but um when when i when i hear muslims say that allah can't enter into his creation i always think how foolish of Allah to create a world he couldn't enter into, right? It's like, you know, if, if you were following me around, you'd probably see me lock myself out of my house like three times a day. And some of it just has to do with how our house is set up and our situation. Uh, we often have to, so I have a young daughter who's actually, she's, uh, you know, uh, almost 14 here, but um, she's our youngest but she has certain allergies to food. So we try to keep foods and smells out of the house. And that means that sometimes I'm going out a door. I have a, a, a garage basement. It's a basement that I've turned into an office. 
And so I might go out, like, let's say I get something from the uh, fridge in the kitchen to go cook outside because we have things set up outside. And then I'll go around to my, my basement and I forget that I didn't unlock the basement door. But then I lock the door upstairs around the house behind me when I left. So I end up getting locked out of my house a lot, right? And I just do this sort of thing all the time. But I mean, one thing is that, uh, well, I won't, I won't go down the rest of that. I was gonna tell you how I get in. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's just because I know I'm so forgetful. But, um, you know, but your deity, right? Your deity created a world he couldn't enter into. He's, he's that absent-minded. He's supposed to be omniscient, but he, uh, he, he didn't think about, uh, you know, creating keys for this place. He's like some sort of, uh, you know, absentee landlord, um, you know, who gave the keys to the tenants, but didn't keep a spare copy for himself. I mean, I, you know, that to me is problematic. But then the other thing is, so I, one of the things I notice that, that stands out to me is I think that what you have in the Quran ends up, you, you have two different tracks in the Quran because on the one hand, Muhammad was a pagan, right? He, he was a pagan. He was not inspired by God. I'm giving the, the Christian account here. And of course, I can argue all of that. But he, he, was, uh, he was a pagan, but he was trying to amalgamate his thinking to Judaism and Christianity, right? So he liked the idea of one God. He, he liked some of those sorts of things, but he couldn't get away from thinking in pagan categories, even when he was doing that. Right. So he still ends up having an anthropomorphic being, for example. Um, he talks about a deity who's aloof, who's above the seven heavens. Uh, all of this sort of leads Muslims to the idea that Allah can't enter into his creation. But remember, he's not just a pagan who's trying to paganize paganism. I mean, he's trying to uh, Christianize or Judaize paganism. Right. He's trying to turn it into a kind of pagan monotheism, right, which leads to this sort of thing, right, that Allah can't enter into his creation. But then he's borrowing from Jews and Christians. So he ends up incorporating into the Quran stories that would later become problematic for Muslims, like Allah appearing to Moses on Mount, or at the right side of uh, Mount Sinai, right? Uh, you also have Hadith where it says that Allah descends to the lowest heaven uh, in the last third of the night. So petition him then, right? You've, you've got statements about uh, uh, Allah moving from place to place. So you, you have these inconsistencies and it's because Muhammad <clears throat> is trying to come up with his own religion, but also uh, assimilate it to Judaism and Christianity as well as Zoroastrianism. You know, it's a buffet, right? A little bit of this, a little bit of that. And uh, he, he ends up with this mishmash of contradictory teachings. So that's where you ultimately end up then getting these different sects in Islam. You have some that are, that are running on one of these trajectories and uh, refusing to uh, you know, bring it together with this other thing. And then you have the other people running along this trajectory and, and denying this side of things. And neither one of those are compatible. It's not like they harmonize. So you know, uh, that's where you get the Salafis on the one hand and the Asharis on the other. Uh, Excellent. So a uh, question from Marilyn Murth Murphy. Do the Hadith um, mention Allah's body parts being white like Muhammad's body parts? Um, well, there's nothing clear that I can think of. They do associate Allah with light. Um, but you know, again, I mean, I, I guess you can assume that, so, so when the Quran talks about, uh, or the Hadiths talk about the creation of man, they talk about the, uh, some Hadiths talk about different angels gathering different kind of clay, different colored dust from different parts of the world. And so that's what ultimately ends up accounting for the different colors that people have, right? Because there were different colors of clay. Um, and so if you think of something comparable in terms of light, right, different colors of light, Allah is made of light, um, just, just like Satan was made of fire, right? But he's, he's a physical being, but he's made of fire. Um, man is made of 
water, but he's still a physical being, right? So I think you might be able to say you can extrapolate that Allah must be white based on the fact that it was white light that ultimately, uh, you know, he, he's, com he's made out of. Um, uh, just like, you know, I don't know, I'm trying to think if there's a description of the color of the jinn because um, the jinn are physical creatures too, even though they're made out of fire, right? And, um, you know, because they eat, they defecate, they urinate. Um, Satan even needs to find lodging in your nose at night, right? To get out of the inclement weather. Uh, so. Or, I, or your ears if he doesn't want you to hear the call to prayer. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, what's funny about that is... Um, in the Muslim world, they actually, um, they will refer to Muslims who don't wake up for prayer as the toilets of Satan, right? So that's a reference to other Muslims. Um, so if you ever, <laughs> nah, I won't say it, but uh, I was going to say, uh, I will say it, I guess. Um, you know, you ever meet a Muslim who's not praying, say, you know, Oh, 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 uh, there are actually, so there, there, there was this one Muslim I saw one time where he says, no wonder people stink when they wake up in the morning, right? Because <laughs> they, they stink when they wake up in the morning because they didn't wake up for prayer. Uh, and so Satan urinated in their ears. He used them like toilets. So they sound, they smell like an outhouse or a toilet that's not been flushed or something. <laughs> All right. On a, on, a, on a more serious note, I, I think that the, you know, Muhammad being described as white probably comes from that idea that he's created from the light of Allah. You right. know, we see that illusion in the Quran and then it's picked up in the Sira that light. So I, th I think that it's more about Muhammad being special than, um, you know, it's talking about his skin color in reality, even though it's really useful to use it against people who say that, you know, Islam's a black man's religion or whatever. Uh, Air Church says, how do Muslims typically reconcile these physical with the spiritual nature of Yahweh? I mean, is isn't obvious that the two deities are incompatible in this way. Well, so a lot of Christians haven't been sufficiently informed to take this to Muslims. So uh, I, I would say, number one, a lot of Muslims haven't been challenged on this to really, you know, uh, see what kind of answers a lot of them would give. Um, so, so first of all, you, you, there are some Muslims who, who just ignore these, these Hadith narrations or try and come up with ways to redefine them. Uh, that would be like the contemporary Asharis. But there are Salafis who represent the most vocal among Muslims. So for example, a lot of the Muslims that you see today that are out there in uh, doing Dawah, right, on, on the internet, for example, like um, Ali Dawa, since I mentioned Dawa, Ali Dawa, Dawa Man, uh, Muhammad Hijab, uh, all these characters, they're all Salafis, right? The, just the, the vast body of these Muslims are people who believe Allah has physical, or he has attributes, characteristics like hands and feet and so forth, as well as Shamsi. Um, I mean, you could name a Muslim nine times out of 10, the ones that we know about from in terms of Dawah apologetics, they're all Salafis, right? Uh, so, but, but they're not used to being challenged on this, right? I think this is getting out there a little bit more. I've been doing a lot of stuff trying to get this out there. I've been doing stuff on Acts 17 apologetics. I've been writing articles on it. I've brought it up in debates. So I do see people using this a little bit more, um, but it's still kind of, I think it's still relatively new in the sense that not that it's a new idea, but it's, it's, it's new in the sense that people are starting to use it more. So it'll be interesting to see how Muslims start to try and deal with this. I remember in Muhammad's hijabs debate with David, he just pretended like he didn't know what David was talking about. Right. And I, the whole time I'm watching that, I'm like, you filthy liar, right? You filthy liar. I know you believe this because I've watched you. Right. So, um, uh, one thing they might do is just lie, right? The other thing they'll do is just, they'll say, well, then the Bible's been corrupted, right? They'll claim the Bible was corrupted and that's why the Quran teaches something different. Um, but 
Uh, you know, it's, I, I think a lot of uh, Western con converts to Islam uh, stumble over this when they find this out. Like there are a lot of people who assume that Islam just has this general notion of God like Christians would have, Jews would have, of God as spirit and infinite and immutable. Um, uh, but once they find out about this, this is one of those things that really turns them away because they think this just doesn't make any sense. How can the God who created time, space, and matter himself be a being who is contingent on time, space, and matter for his very existence, right? If Allah, if Allah has anatomical features, then it necessarily requires those other conditions to be in place, right? There has to be time, time and space in which Allah can exist. Uh, so, um, uh, I, you know, a lot of Christians or people who profess to be Christians who convert to Islam uh, are sold a bill of goods. And once they find out that this is a bogus product, they end up, you know, saying so much the worse for this religion. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, so Abdul Al-Qadi said, to defend Christianity, you tell lies about the Quran. Well, first of all, I'll just point out that we're telling you what Islamic scholars say. So if they're lies, they're not our lies. But then he says, why don't you talk about the Bible? So is it true that you never talk about the Bible? <laughs> well, so far on my channel, I don't think I... Um, so I, I did have videos I took down temporarily that I'm going to put back up, but right now on my channel, I have, I mean, I don't know how many videos I have on there right now, 15, 20, and all of them are about the Bible, except for one where I have Abu Musab and, um, Suhaib Webb duking it out, right? So you, you guys all have to go watch that. Uh, Abu Musab and Suhaib Webb are duking it out, but that's just two Muslims arguing with each other. Okay. It's not anything I've said, but um, no, I talk about the Bible all the time. In the first place, I'm a pastor. I go into prisons. I preach Christianity to people. I teach Christianity on my YouTube page. I write articles and journal entries about Christianity. I've contributed to various books about Christianity. Um, you know, so Islam doesn't take up the whole of my time. It doesn't even take up most of my time. Uh, however, uh, the Bible itself commands me to preach Christianity to people, and part of Christian te teaching Christianity to people means pointing out the difference. And in the course of that, we're also told to tear down those things that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. Uh, the Apostle Paul said that we uh, destroy speculations and every high thing that's raised up against the knowledge of God. And moreover, the Quran if you want to really get down to brass tacks, the Quran talks more about my faith than my Bible talks about your faith, right? Your Quran at attacks Christianity, but the Bible doesn't attack Islam, does it? You know why? Because Islam didn't exist. But the Quran over and over again attacks Christian beliefs, it attacks the Trinity, misdefines the Trinity, attacks Jesus, attacks the, the true teaching about Jesus, puts false words in Jesus' mouth, just like Muhammad said Satan put words in his mouth, so Muhammad puts words in uh, Jesus' mouth that he never spoke <clears throat> and attributes false things to Jesus that he never said, like, oh, Allah, I never said, take me and my mother for two gods. Uh, Jesus never said those words because Jesus uh, did teach his own deity, not the deity of his mother. Uh, he did teach uh, that he's one with his father. He did teach that he would die on the cross, did teach that he would rise again from the dead, did teach that forgiveness uh, would be preached in his name, that all men must repent and believe in him. Um, but in any case, the, the, the basic point here is the Quran attacks Christianity. Muhammad ridiculed non-Muslim uh, beliefs, right? He ridiculed the pagans. That's part of why they didn't like him. That's why they ran him out of town. That's why you guys have a, uh, you know, uh, divide time uh, from what was pre-Hijra to what's post-Hijra, right? So uh, I don't know why Muslims make those sorts of objections, but they just don't work. <laughs> yep, very well put. Uh, Air Church says all of this, what we've talked about today, implies that Allah has a locality. Where is Allah's arsh or throne located? Uh, I know that you produced a video in a, a while back for uh, David's channel on that subject. It's one of my favorite videos all time. I uh, I have, uh, I have an article called um, 
the great divorce on answering Islam, the great divorce. What I point out in the article is that the Quran describes Allah being above the seven heavens, above the throne, which is held up by eight angels, which is atop the seven heavens and the seven earths, right? So he's way up there, right? And uh, the distance between each earth and each heaven is, is a, a huge difference. I think it's like 500 years between each. Uh, so Allah's way up above all of that. And the, the reason I call it the great divorce is because according to Islamic scholars, Remember I mentioned before that Islamic scholars will say that Allah's knowledge is somehow present, but Allah himself is not. So notice you, you necessarily have this bifurcation between Allah and his attribute. Somehow Allah's attribute of seeing can be said to be here and with us, while Allah himself is not. Now, if that doesn't commit shirk, I don't know what does. How are Allah's attributes floating around other places? <laughs> I mean, it, it literally, um, you know, when, when uh, well, I don't want to get into a whole theological thing here, but it is a huge problem in Islam because they insist that Allah is absolutely one. We're guilty of shirk for saying that God exists in three persons, but here they are talking about Allah having separate parts. And these parts are so other than each other that you can speak of his attribute of seeing being here while Allah is infinitely removed from here. And that, if anything, suggests a, a cleavage uh, uh, between Allah and his attributes. Just like the Quran is here, by the way, which is Allah's attribute of speech, according to Muslims, right? So there are at least two of Allah's attributes running around rogue uh, without Allah, right? Uh, his attribute of speech is here and his attribute of uh, seeing is here. But Allah's not here. Absolutely. Where the throne is located, and you made some good fun of that in your, your video, you know, just quoting the one mother, some scholar against the, you didn't have to say anything. You just go to, made them duke it out, as you put it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I did, uh, I did that one years ago. Um, that's been viewed hundreds of thousands of times. And a lot of people think David made that video. Um, but then just recently, I did another one on the Quran. And it was because so Islam critiqued said to me, he said, you should do a video like that on the Quran. And so I don't know if you saw that one where it's a bunch of Muslim scholars going back and forth, right? <laughs> one saying not a single uh, difference between any Quran, the next Muslim saying, there are thousands of differences uh, between <laughs> uh, different Qurans. Um, you know, so back and forth, all these Muslim scholars contradicting each other. I'll, I'll probably do several more like that. I just have to, sometimes it just takes a little push. So in this case, it was because Islam critique said, you should do one on this. And uh, other times it just takes, it takes me seeing enough thing from Muslims to say, I've got enough here for a video. Right. I, and then I just I start going back because I watch I watch hundreds of hours of videos. Uh, I maximize my time like I, I'm here at a hotel right now. I drove seven hours to preach out of town for another pastor. And that gives me a lot of listening time. And so I'll remember what I hear and I'll say, OK, this from this video, this from this video. And then I'll just put them all together and um, voila, come out with uh, a masterpiece. Yeah, that, that uh, I've seen both of those, and uh, you know the the original "Where's All His Throne" is one of my favorite videos. I did I did actually think David made it originally, but I eventually figured it out. Um, <laughs> and that that and the newer version with the Quran is equally hilarious. Uh, I do have a question from my wife. Uh, she noticed your shirt, and she was actually uh, grew up in a a Greenville, so she was wondering which state your Greenville shirt is from. South Carolina. All right, not the right one then. <laughs> so what's what's funny though is I just passed through Greenville, North Carolina, if that's what she's thinking of. I know there are others. Yeah, I think probably just about every state has one, but she's actually from Texas. Oh, okay. So I'm originally from California, but uh, yeah, this is a shirt from Greenville, South Carolina. Um, but I, I have heard there are a bunch of different Greenvilles, but Greenville is where I went to seminary. There's a seminary there that I went to. Excellent. 
Uh, we have a question. I'm not sure if it's a serious question or not, but Tippy Bear would like to know if Allah has a butt to sit on his throne with. So you'd have to assume so, but here's the funny thing. Um, Muslims, like you would assume, right, if, 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 for example, the Islamic sources say Allah has a shin, you'd naturally assume that Muslims who believe then that hadith, that he has a shin, take it literally, literally like the hadith indicates that they would believe that Allah has two shins but really when you look at the Islamic scholars who accept these things for what they tell you they say unless Allah says it then you don't have a right to believe it so it might be natural for you to extrapolate from something that's said to what seems logically to be entailed by that but that's just not how they think so what Muslims will tell you is the Quran only mentions a, or the, the Hadith only mentions a shin, so we can't say Allah has two shins, right? So that, uh, what, what that always reminds me of then is it reminds me of those, you ever, remember that, uh, that lamp? Was it, um, what's that movie? Um, I think it's uh, A Christmas Carol or something like that, where they've got that lamp with the leg, right? Mm -hmm. There's this leg and then there's a, a lamp on top of it, right? So Allah is like this being with two right arms, one shin, um, you know, but you can't assume that the rest of the anatomy is there. You, you can only go on what you've been told about. So he does have an arm and elbow, hands, two right hands, um, palms and fingers and fingertips, a face, eyes, ears, um, feet, and a side, at least one side, a right side, you can't say he has a left side because it doesn't say that. Um, and I'm assuming it's a right shin, not a left shin, uh, but it doesn't say that either. But I, so I'm just, well, all I'm getting at is Muslims will tell you if it's not explicitly stated, then you can't affirm it. You can only affirm for what uh, Allah, what Allah affirms for himself, right? So some Muslims will say, you can't say he has a buttocks because Allah doesn't say he has a buttocks, right? You can say hand, you can say gonads because Allah says he has gonads. Um, you could say hand, you can say uh, foot, shin, all that, but you can't go beyond that. Um, so, yeah, yeah, you know, taking to, you know, that idea that you can't say anything that isn't stated to the absurdity, it says he has two feet, but he only says he has one shin. So, yeah, so it'd have to be like, yeah, one shin with two feet on it connected to. Um, you know, his loins connected to a side with two right arms and a face. <laughs> I haven't seen any reference to his neck. So, I mean, I don't know. There's, uh, I don't know how this all works out. Excellent. Uh, William James has said a number of times that he wants you to do another video like the Throne of Allah or the uh, different opinions about the Quran. Yeah, I just got to think of another topic. Um, I know David asked me a while ago to give him a, a bunch of videos on Muslims talking about the age of Aisha. Um, of course, he's seen stuff, but he knows that I just sort of catalog this stuff in my head. And so he was asking. And so then I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to give him videos on this, I should also make a whole collage on it. Um, I just don't know if that one would be as humorous part of the value of these other ones is it's communicating certain things in a very humorous way right you see um i did do one on I, I think i'll probably do one on allah's hands because i had a video on allah's hands before on my channel which i took down and i'll probably rework that um because i did get some pretty good back and forth between some muslims they're not really talking to each other but the way I do it is it makes it look like they're responding to each other sometimes, right? So I may do something like that on Allah's hands um, because I have, I, I do know of a bunch of clips like that, but the, the Aisha stuff would be more, I guess, you know, I, I, if I thought about it some, I might be able to come up with a good way to make this, um, you know, some things we do are entertaining. Some things we do are informative. Some things are intended to be both. And so I just have to think of a way that uh, I know the hands issue I can do in an informative, entertaining way. 
the Aisha Wad, I'm not so sure yet. I'd have to think through that. Um, I don't know how you make that entertaining per se. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it might be a little too obvious to just be like, she was nine. Though. We don't know how old she was. She was nine. We don't know. <laughs> she was 18. Yeah. Whereas, the, you know, the other things, like, say, the Throne of Allah, those aren't, like, well known that there's a debate. So, you know, you're also informing us that there's this debate at the same time. Yeah, and part of what gave rise to that, by the way, is I kept hearing Muslims for years in their dawah efforts, it was nauseating, they were getting away with murder, saying to Christians, your doctrine of God is, is complicated, right? So if nothing else, even if Christians... Um, didn't accept the critique of Christianity. They still felt sort of uh, on the the defensive end, right? Where they're, you know, because they Muslims could always say, oh, our doctrine of God is simple. And I thought the only reason Muslims are getting away with this is because Christians don't know Muslim theology. And Muslims at least think they know Christian theology. So they can often, you know, get Christians all, you know, jumbled up because they're saying, you believe in three gods as one God, right? No Christian, Orthodox Christian believes that, but they at least can say something like that. And then they can say, oh, that's so very complicated. Your explanation, it's, you know, our God is simple, right? We just believe in one God. That's it. Uh, that's all there is to it. We all agree. We're all unanimous, very simple. And so I thought, what are you talking about, right? I mean, have you been reading what I'm reading? Where are you people, you know, getting your information? And so I realized there are all sorts of disputes among Muslims, disputes over the relationship of Allah to his attributes, right? Are his attributes identical with his essence? Are his attributes identical with each other? Are his attributes uh, distinct from him and from each other? Uh, all these different positions have been held by Muslims. Does he only have metaphysical attributes like life, uh, you know, spirituality, uh, knowledge, or does he also have anthropomorphic attributes? Again, these are deb debated by Muslims. And all of this gets, gets very confusing very quickly. So much so that Muslims even have a saying, right? What, one of their famous sayings is, Allahu alam, right? Allah knows best, right? That was especially used with respect to this issue of Allah's anthropomorphic attributes. Or they'll say, bilak haif, bilak haif, without saying how. In other words, we say Allah has a hand because Allah says he has hands, but we don't say how, right? So that's supposed to end all argument, right? Allah has hands. There's no, no more argument here, right? Um, but they don't accept that sort of thing from Christians, do they? How could this be, right? How can this be, right? But they have this saying, we don't say how, right? Without saying how. So they want to ask us how, but then forbid us from asking how with respect to Allah. So I started thinking, time for somebody to start turning the tables here because they've got all kinds of problems, right? Allah can't enter the world. Um, you know, does he have attributes? He doesn't have attributes. Is he up, up in the, uh, you know, above the seven heavens? Is he in this dunya? Is he not in this dunya? Is he nowhere? I mean, there's just, you know, so that was my, that was the catalyst behind all that. Yeah. I mean, you're quite right that they, they've historically been speaking out of a position of strength, so to speak, that they feel like they can criticize Christianity. But since most Christians have no clue anything Islam teaches, they can just say whatever they want about Islam because they don't really have any knowledge. Uh, DHC21 suggested that David Wood should make a origami of um, Allah the deformed Allah as his next origami. So we might want to suggest that to him. <laughs> yeah, an origami Allah. That could be, that could be great because we could do, oh, so I, he was going to do a video once because I mentioned the Mr. Potato Head analogy before he was going to do a video on that. But this, uh, that'd be interesting. So so sometimes I get these ideas, right? And then I give them to David because I think there are certain things I do really well. There are certain things he does really well. And uh, so there are sometimes I'll get an idea and I'll think, oh, David's going to do this way better than I'll do this, right? So I pass it off to David. And so I'm thinking, uh, you know, it'd be 
it'd be interesting to see what David would come up with if I if I started if I mentioned the origami thing to him. Um, so kudos to whoever mentioned that. But uh, if I mention it to him, yeah, I mean, uh, I I don't know that, that that might be pretty tricky coming up with an origami. They probably don't have any origami uh, teachings on how to make a a figure with only one shin and two right hands and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it'd be quite a challenge. Yeah, but that would be something. Uh, so I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. Uh, do you have any last comments you'd like to make? No, thanks for having me on. Always happy to be on. Uh, happy to, uh, you know, inform people all I can, whenever I can, so that they can use this in their counter Dawa efforts, in their evangelistic efforts. And, uh, you know, in every other way that it's useful. So. Uh. Excellent. Yes, thank you very much for coming on. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, for Abdullah or anyone else who wants to check out your teachings on the Bible, I definitely suggest heading over to Anthony's channels. His uh, teachings are extremely in-depth, extremely informative, uh, great material. So definitely check those out. Uh, tomorrow morning, I will have my weekly Bible study on my other channel, the Reasoned Worship channel. So uh, check out the link to that if you're interested in that. This coming week, I will be having uh, one or two live streams, so look for an announcement on those as well. Thank you all for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day, whether it's just beginning or coming to an end. Thank you, and God bless.